Hi learners, it's Em from Sano Nerds, and this video is going to be on the male pelvis looking at how to perform a scrotum ultrasound. So what are we going to learn today? Because this is a sensitive exam, I really want you to know what to expect when doing a scrotum ultrasound. And then we also need to know how to document the entire testicle and scrotum and make sure that we are familiar with normal ultrasound appearance so we can easily recognize abnormal. There are tons of reasons why a scrotum ultrasound may be ordered, so take a moment to pause and read through these. Out of these indications, the most popular ones are probably going to be the evaluation of scrotal pain or a mass that has been felt either by the patient or the provider. Whatever the reason is though, there typically is no patient prep for this exam. When an ultrasound is ordered for the scrotum, we want to make sure that we review the patient's medical chart for symptoms, labs, and any previous imaging. I also like to make sure that I get my room set up for the exam. So this is going to include turning the machine on, having all the patient information already entered, pulling up my auto protocol on the machine, and then having towels, a sheet, warm gel, and gloves ready. Once I get the patient back to the room, I always confirm their identity with two identifiers, usually their last name and date of birth. I then have them take a seat in one of the chairs and keep them fully dressed while I review their patient history, explain the exam to them, tell them how they receive results, and answer any questions that they might have. You also want to make sure that you get consent from the patient to do the exam. A verbal consent is usually enough, but make sure that you get their consent after you have fully explained the exam and the process. Due to the intimate nature of the exam, this can be kind of terrifying for the patient and new ultrasound techs. If at any point in the exam there is tension or inappropriate behavior or comments, it's okay to stop the exam and reschedule or ask a coworker to chaperone the exam. For many of us, our jobs are second nature to us, and we might scan multiple scrotums throughout the week, but for a lot of patients, this is probably their first ultrasound, or at least the first one of their genitals. So by telling the patient what you're doing or why you need something can help a lot. So I like to make sure that I use a lot of carrying out loud phrases while I'm getting the patient set up for the exam. For example, I will say that the ultrasound will be able to see into the body, so I need to be able to have the transducer in contact with the skin. Therefore, you'll be undressing from the waist down. For us, we know that already, but the patient probably doesn't, and so they might think it's weird that you have to undress all the way down. They didn't have to undress for their x-ray, or maybe they didn't have to undress for their CT or other imaging exams. Some other examples of phrases that I might use are, I'm going to step behind the curtain for your privacy, or I'm going to make sure I keep you covered for your comfort. I will be using warm gel and very little pressure since I know you're already in pain. Phrases like these not only give insight to what you're going to do, but you're also hitting on some major buzzwords that show up in patient satisfaction surveys as well. I really encourage students and new scanners to learn the quote unquote prep talk from as many sonographers as possible. That way you'll have some ideas for how you want to explain the exam and get them ready. Now my own talk has evolved over the years and I feel like I've landed on one that is easy and efficient. So just to share mine with you, typically what I do is I have the sheet lying on the table that I want them to cover up with. So I point at the sheet and I say, undress from the waist down. So socks, shoes, and underwear need to come off. Lie down on the bed, open up the sheet completely, and cover yourself. I'm going to step out while you do that. I will be back. So then I give them a minute to do that. Knock before I come back in. Make sure that they are appropriately covered, and then I'll walk in. From here then, I hand them a towel and say, keep this towel just as it is underneath the sheet, move your penis away from your testicles and cover up with the towel. So I, while they're doing that, then I kind of busy myself with uh, foaming in, washing my hands, getting my gloves on, kind of getting the machine set up the rest of the way. Once I can kind of see out of the side of my eye that they have done the towel part, then I tell them I'm going to move the sheet down so I can get to your testicles. Before I do that, I'm going to have you lift your testicles, put your thighs together, and then place your testicles back so they are side by side. It makes it easier for me to scan them this way. So when I'm doing my speech, I try to go step by step and not giving them too much direction or too much information at each step. 
Over the years, I've definitely heard some variations on this. I've been with sonographers who prefer to have the patient only move their pants and underwear down to about mid-thigh, and then they have them get set up the rest of the way from there. Uh, some sonographers prefer that there is a towel underneath the testicles and might place that there themselves. Uh, sometimes the patient is instructed to tuck the ends of the towel underneath their bottoms. So that kind of holds the penis tight to the body. Uh, there's lots of different options that you can do. There is no absolutely correct way, but the best way is the way that gets the patient to do what you need. So be clear and concise when you instruct the patient. For most scrotal exams, a high-frequency linear transducer with a wide footprint is all that you will need, but you should have a curved linear transducer also available. Another tip for when you're scanning the scrotum is to use a lot of warm gel, and I mean a lot of warm gel. This is going to work in your advantage in a couple of different ways. First off, if you find that the testicles are kind of retracting, a lot of the time that's because it's a little cold. So if you have colder gel or the room's a little chilly, that warm gel is going to help a lot. As those testicles retract up to the body, uh, it's very difficult to get good imaging of them and to get good color fill on the blood vessels within the testicles. So again, try warmer gel, warmer the better, but not too hot because that can also have a negative effect on the patient. And then also try giving the patient a moment to relax if you find that that is happening. You also need to make sure that you're using enough gel to remain in contact with the testicles. You've got a flat surface of your transducer that you're trying to come in contact with rounded structures. So sometimes more gel is going to help with that. And then it also helps to eliminate any air that might be in the folds of the skin of the scrotum. Some other tips for scanning, you'll want to make sure to set your depth appropriately. So increase the depth so you can see just past the posterior portion of the testicle. You want to make sure that you're using a lighter touch, but still enough pressure that you maintain contact with the whole testicle, making sure that you don't have any dropout on either end of the transducer. More focal zones might be helpful when scanning the testicle since it is a non-mobile structure and will help to improve your lateral resolution. And again, make sure that you have a curved linear transducer nearby. Sometimes the high frequency probes don't penetrate all the way through, the more swollen or larger scrotums. Another important communication tool that you'll need to have during your exam is how to explain the Valsalva maneuver. Now the Valsalva maneuver is a forced expiration against a closed airway. So as medical workers, many of us are familiar with the Valsalva maneuver as the same pressure created to have a bowel movement. Many of our patients though do not know what a Valsalva maneuver is, so we just need a clear and quick explanation. So for children and actually some adults, I often use the hand balloon method. I ask them to place their thumb to their mouth as if their hand was a balloon and their thumb the neck of the balloon or the part we blow into. Then I have them do just that, try to blow into their thumb. This causes expiration against a lot of resistance, resulting in a Valsalva maneuver. Another explanation that you can try is describing it as the same thing we do when we try to unplug our ears after flying, where we pinch our nose, close our mouth, and kind of breathe out. I have even told patients that it is that pressure that we create to have bowel movements. And then, of course, jokingly ask them not to actually go to the bathroom on my bed, but just recreate that pressure. And it usually gets a chuckle out of them. If all else fails, usually standing the patient up and scanning can work too if a Valsalva maneuver cannot be achieved by the patient. Some other explanations that I've heard other sonographers use is telling the patient that it's kind of like flexing your stomach muscles, like you're going to do a sit-up but not actually sit up. Uh, I personally have found that that actually causes a lot of motion with the patient actually trying to sit up on the bed and not really achieving what I need from the Valsalva maneuver. Once the exam is done, using those care out loud techniques, I instruct the patient to clean themselves off and then remind them of the results process. I usually will then again step out to allow them some privacy to clean up. This is probably more personal preference, but I prefer not to clean the patient up myself, uh, given, again, the sensitive nature of the exam. However, if a patient is unable to, I definitely will offer uh, help if they need it. Then the last thing to do is make sure that you clean the probe really, really well. Some places prefer to use wipes. Make sure that you are really cleaning the face of the transducer well, and make sure that the surface of the probe stays wet for as long as required according to the directions on the wipes. 
A lot of times it needs to stay wet for like three to five minutes to completely do its job, kill all the organisms that it's supposed to kill. Other places prefer to use high-level disinfectant like Atrophon or Cydex to clean the transducer. As far as the images that we are going to get, we want to make sure that we are working in a very systematic way. We don't want to take some right testicles and some left and then bounce back and forth, nor do we want to go in between transverse or sagittal images. So when I do my scrotum ultrasound, I typically start on the right testicle, starting in trans, and I'll do a superior, mid, and an inferior picture with measurements at mid, and then I switch to the sagittal images, and I'll work from lateral to medial, again getting measurements at mid, and getting color and pulse wave Doppler images in the long plane. I then take images of the right epididymal head with measurements in color, images of the trans epididymal head with measurements, and then I also do pictures of the spermatic cords looking at the vasculature in there, so I make sure to get color pictures with Valsalva maneuvers to rule out varicoceles. I'll do the same thing on the left, and then my last pictures are going to be bilateral testicle pictures. We're going to take a bilateral picture showing both the right and the left testicle in the same image, or at least dual screening to get a right and a left next to each other. That bilateral testicle image will give us an opportunity to compare the echogenicity of both testicles. And then we absolutely need a bilateral testicle image with color. That color image then is going to allow us to compare the vascularity of both of the testicles. Just having this one bilateral color testicle picture can rule out or rule in some emergent pathology. So it's an extremely key image when imaging the testicles to get that bilateral testicle with color image. The normal measurements of the adult testicle are going to vary depending on the person, but on average we see that the length of the adult testicle is about 3 to 5 centimeters, the width about 2 to 3 centimeters, and the height or the AP dimension also 2 to 3 centimeters. So let's take a look at all of that anatomy we talked about a couple lectures ago and take a look at what it looks like under ultrasound. So remember that the layers of the testicle from outer to inner, we started with scrotal skin, had the tunica dartos, cremaster muscle, internal spermatic fascia, tunica vaginalis, parietal and visceral layers, and then the tunica albuginea. They are all appreciated in ultrasound images, but they're not necessarily the key or the focus of our ultrasound. Uh, typically they are in the images. We might evaluate for scrotal skin thickening, or fluid in between the layers of the tunica vaginalis, but they're not anything that we're going to take actual pictures of. They're just always kind of in there. But let's still go through and take a look at what these normal structures look like. So in this image, we have two testicles. We have the right testicle and the left testicle, and in between them, we have the scrotal septum. So remember that the scrotum is divided into two halves. We have the scrotal skin as the very outside layer. That's the area that the transducer is in contact with. And then we have the tunica dartos, which kind of comes down and in between as part of that scrotal septum. And then on the inside of each half, we have a cremaster muscle, which is a little bit darker bit here. And then we have the internal spermatic fascia, which probably isn't well appreciated here. And we have the tunica vaginalis, which is going to be more of this echogenic area. The tunica albuginea, you can actually see really well right on the top of this testicle. And then we have the testicle parenchyma itself. So that cremaster muscle can be seen all the way around the testicle. Uh, this is the cremaster muscle up in the spermatic cord. It's going to be these a little bit more hypoechoic lines on either side of the spermatic cord, and then it enters into the scrotal sac itself. This is an image from a pediatric patient, so it's probably a little bit more prominent in this picture than maybe some of our adult patients. This is a close-up of the tunica vaginalis. Again, the tunica vaginalis comes in two layers, the parietal layer and the visceral layer. The parietal layer is going to be on the side of the scrotal wall, and we can see that here. And then we have the visceral layer, which is going to be on the side of the scrotum. The tunica vaginalis is going to produce a small amount of fluid, and so that's what we're kind of seeing in between here, separating out those two echogenic lines. A little bit of fluid is normal, 
a lot of fluid is considered pathology. But uh, this picture shows us nicely those two parallel lines either side of that just trace amount of fluid in there. The tunica albuginea then is going to be the third hyperechoic line that is in direct contact with the testicle. So again, if we look in this area here, we have the parietal layer of the tunica vaginalis, a little bit of fluid, and then we have the visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis. And then the next layer down, this third line, is the tunica albuginea. Remember, that's a very dense, fibrous tissue, and it's going to extend into the testicle, uh, creating the scrotal septations, which are not appreciated by ultrasound. Now, I do want to point out that there is this big black area here. This is actually a tunica albuginea cyst. These are benign cysts that arise from the tunica albuginea. Uh, they are usually going to be seen right on the periphery of the testicle, right underneath that tunica albuginea. You can see that here, the tunica albuginea comes up and over the cyst. They are going to appear anechoic with smooth walls, and here we can see that posterior enhancement. We don't see the seminiferous tubules of the testicle on ultrasound either, but the sound interacting with them gives us the appearance of a solid organ, and that is what we're seeing here. So the parenchyma of the testicle appears as a homogeneous gray with a very fine echotexture to it. The mediastinum is going to appear as a bright echogenic line in the middle of the sagittal testicle. So when we are in long or in sagittal on the testicle, we come a little bit more towards the medial side, we're going to see a fibrous band running through the testicle. And this is that mediastinum where all of those scrotal septations are coming together and converging. In the transverse view, we see that the mediastinum starts to round out, again, sitting a little bit more on that medial portion. Sometimes in the transverse view, it can be a little bit trickier to see the mediastinum, and on some people, it's really prominent. So if you ever see anything different from the testicular parenchyma, turn on it. You got to see pathology in both planes. Once you turn on this, we'd get this other picture that we saw before. We'd see it elongate out. It's also worth noting on this testicle, we can kind of see the shadow running through here. This is actually the mediastinal artery. So if we were to put color on that, it would fill with color. Normally the reedy testis is not seen on ultrasound, but dilated reedy testis can be seen. So this is again in the area of the mediastinum, but now it looks a little bit different because we have a dilated reedy testis. And so this is known as tubular ectasia of the reedy testis. So this is going to present as a dilation of the tubules in the reedy testis as this area is exiting the scrotal hilum, heading towards the epididymal head. So you'll see just kind of some cystic spaces at the mediastinum. On ultrasound then, we'll see the head of the epididymis superior to the testicle. So again, we're in the longitudinal plane, shifting up towards the head, we will see the head of the epididymis sitting kind of like a little hat on top of the testicle. It's going to take on a little bit more of a triangular shape in the sagittal plane. It appears maybe isochoic to slightly hypochoic compared to the testicle, and it usually has a little bit of a more coarse echotexture. So again, here is the epididymal head sitting on top of the testicle, just ever so slightly hypochoic compared to the testicular parenchyma. Here we have an elongated body of the epididymis, and you can really see how the coarseness and the exogenicity of this varies from the testicle itself. Another example of where the epididymis sits in comparison to the testicle. So again, we have the head on the superior pole of the testicle, and then we'll see the epididymal body connecting through and being posterior. If you don't see it directly posterior, then I suggest coming out very lateral on the testicle, and you'll usually see it right on the edge of the testicle, running just slightly posterior. In this example of the epididymis, we see that the epididymis is actually quite a bit more hypochoic and very coarse. 
this is actually tubular ectasia of the epididymis. So just like we had tubular ectasia of the reedy testis, we can have tubular ectasia of the epididymis as well. This is commonly seen after a vasectomy where the vas deferens has been severed and sperm no longer can leave the testicle. So we see a little bit of a dilation of the tubules in there. Continuing on with the epididymis then, we can see the epididymal body coming down and into the tail of the epididymis. So the tail sits at the inferior pole of the testicle. Uh, sometimes they're very prominent, especially if they have any sort of infection. Uh, sometimes they are not quite as prominent. We want to make sure that we are using color Doppler on all of our testicular exams. We want to be able to show both arterial and venous flow. So we are going to need very sensitive color Doppler settings. You can see in this example here, the uh, velocities are set at two. So that's a very, very low velocity, but we're getting really nice color flow in here. We use color flow to identify the presence of blood flow in the testicle. Uh, if there was no blood flow in the testicle, we would be concerned for torsion. And if there's too much blood flow in the testicle, we would be concerned for some sort of infection of the testicle. In this image, we can see the mediastinal artery cutting through the middle of the testicle. We can also see the capsular artery and then the centripetal arteries and the recurrent rami as well, those kind of candy cane shapes. We'll make sure to get a Doppler tracing of the blood flow in the testicular arteries, and they should be low resistive waveforms. So that means that there's blood flowing forward at all times. So we've got a peak here and then forward flow through diastole. We also want to make sure that we grab some venous waveforms as well. In the case of torsion, venous waveforms are actually the first ones to disappear. So we want to make sure that we are documenting that the venous pathways are patent as well in the testicle. And I had mentioned this earlier when we were talking about the protocol, but we always, always, always want to make sure that we get that bilateral image with color. So a grayscale bilateral image is going to allow us to compare the echo texture, where a bilateral color image is going to allow us to compare the color flow. So just looking at these two, we can see that the left scrotum is hyperemic. It's got increased blood flow compared to the right. The other thing we're seeing is echo texture wise, we're seeing a much thicker scrotal skin compared to the right. And so if this patient was presenting with pain, this one picture tells us that the patient is not suffering from torsion and is actually most likely suffering from some sort of infection of the left testicle due to the scrotal wall thickening and the increased vascularity. The spermatic cord should also be evaluated with color and a Valsalva maneuver. The color is going to show us if there's any dilated veins that would lead to the diagnosis of a varicocele, or if there's any other masses or any other vascular abnormalities in the spermatic cord. And then the Valsalva maneuver also kind of shows us how things are moving. Is there an opening between the abdomen and the scrotum that might allow bowel to herniate through the opening or is there some other vascular abnormality again like a varicocele at the level of the spermatic cord so in this little clip here we can see as the patient valsalvas we can see the structures moving due to the interabdominal pressure appendages of the epididymis and the testicle can be appreciated with ultrasound we usually see them as kind of soft tissue masses hanging off of either so on the left here we can see this little round structure hanging off of the epididymis. So that is an epididymal appendix. And then on this one, we can see a little bit of a soft tissue mass hanging off the testicle itself, making that a testicular appendix. We're going to use color on these as well, just to show that they do still have blood flow as these little things can torse uh, as well. But we'll discuss that more in the torsion lecture. Part of the reason that these appendices are seen so well is because there is actually fluid in between the layers of the tunica vaginalis. So if you recall back, that is called a hydrocele, and that extra fluid can kind of highlight structures. In the case of half of the scrotal sac being empty, we want to make sure that if you don't see that testicle, that you go and find the testicle. 
So oftentimes you're going to see the testicle up in the inguinal canal, so that should be your first place to look. So in this image here, we have a normal testicle in the scrotum compared to that of a testicle that was found in the inguinal canal. Oftentimes, testicles that are in the inguinal canal are going to be more hypoechoic and they're going to be quite a bit smaller. Opposite of that, then, is polyorchidism, which is pretty rare, but we would see a third testicle within the scrotal sac. Usually, that third testicle is over on the left side. The third testicle tends to be quite a bit smaller and often less or non functional.